This week, I'm sharing with you a lecture that I gave for the University of Vermont. One of these days, I'll feel comfortable traveling again, and I'll actually go there. This is a Zoom lecture, which is great because I get to record it and share it with you all. In this lecture, I'm talking about something that I feel pretty strongly about, and that is cardiac arrest ultrasound. I'm gonna talk about a bunch of different stuff. I'm gonna talk about the reversible causes, about how ultrasound can help with that. I'm also gonna talk about ultrasound-guided procedures, and then I'm gonna talk about ultrasound during pulse checks, which that is something that sometimes is a little bit of controversy. There's no controversy from my point of view. I'll, I mention it during the podcast, but The ultrasound does not delay pulse checks. The ultrasound is some inanimate object that happens to be in the room helping you out. What delays pulse checks are humans. So humans are delaying pulse checks, not the ultrasound. 10 seconds is 10 seconds all the time. We'll talk about that and a little more of the research during the lecture. Before I show you the lecture itself, which is pretty happy about, I gotta let you know about a couple of things. Don't forget to check out the core ultrasound question bank. We have 3,200 ultrasound pathology and normal clips for you to identify, is this right heart strain, is this pericardial effusion? It's a great way to supplement your education as any kind of a medical provider. We also have a fundamentals course that's online. This was initially created for interns that maybe don't have a whole lot of experience. So it's just like a boot camp. Uh, it's built to be over a month, but you could probably finish it in like a week or a few days if you were just focusing on that. I also have a conference coming up, my first in-person conference in my new home in sunny San Diego. The URL is right here. And this is gonna be a combined conference with the one of the creators of the Pocus Atlas, Mike Macias, who also lives here in San Diego with me. Don't forget to check out that conference. We're also gonna put those lectures online for you to be able to purchase online as well afterwards. Now, without any further ado, here is the podcast. If you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. What we're going to talk about today is the arresting and peri-arresting patient and how you can use ultrasound to help adequately manage that patient. I would even say expertly manage that patient. So I like to think about ultrasound and cardiac arrest in three broad topics, procedural, identifying reversible causes, and then using it during pulse checks. And let's talk about all these in turn. Probably the easiest one to talk about is this one, which is identifying reversible causes of arrest. Now this mnemonic is, is I don't know guys, it's, it's awful, I think. It's like the worst mnemonic I've ever seen in my life. It's the H's and T's, like I don't know, like it's hard for me to remember all the H's and all the T's, but this is our mnemonic, I guess, that we have in emergency medicine for identifying reversible causes. There's a bunch of stuff on here, and these things, ultrasound doesn't really, it can't really help you. I'm sure there's like a case here and there where ultrasound has helped you identify like some kind of like an ingestion as a cause of arrest. Uh, But for the most part, these things are not ultrasound related, which is okay. Remember that the ultrasound is a tool in your quiver or an arrow in your toolbox. It's something to help you with your patient. It's not necessarily the end all be all, but there are situations in which your ultrasound is for sure the best test, especially at the bedside, especially when you need it fast. These are the things that do really well with ultrasound. Tamponade, hypovolemia, attention, pneumothorax, thrombosis, so that's a MI or a PE, and then of course, trauma. Let's start off with hypovolemia. If I have a patient that's just circling their drain, I usually start with the heart examination. It gives me the most information, and honestly, it's often the easiest way to identify something that's reversible. If I see somebody that's 50s over palp with a heart rate of like 160, and I see this echo, without really knowing too much more information, let's say they just rolled in, I'm gonna assume that this patient could probably tolerate, at least tolerate fluids. Fluids won't harm this patient, which is a good first step, right? I mean, if you have a patient that came in this way, you start this way, and they were a trauma patient, maybe even start with blood. But in any case, this is a thirsty looking left side of that heart. This is a patient with a very high ejection fraction, likely could use fluids. Now, if you add on that IVC and you see that it's nice and pencil thin, it's collapsing 100% with respiration, this is a patient that would push you even more to that needs fluid category. Probably my favorite thing to diagnose intra-arrest is tampon. Now, I don't want my patients to have this, obviously, but 
when they have this, I like to be the one that diagnoses it. Now for this, this is something that surprisingly, when you look at the literature where they actually record this data, it's actually fairly common. Now these are the three studies that I could find after a pretty extensive uh, literature review that actually reported the amount of patients that had pericardial effusions during arrest. And you can see that it ranges from 4.3 to 8%. And these weren't super small studies. This uh, 2010 study, the Brykrutz, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, a study, they actually performed seven pericardiocentesis, which is 8% of their population. And they said three were unsuccessful. So they successfully had four. They didn't have necessarily outcomes associated with that, but they just were like showing the data. The Zengen study in 2016 had 179 patients. So a large amount of patients showed 5.6%. And then my favorite study, that Gaspari uh, study, this was actually one that if you're uh, kind of level two into ultrasound and you wanna learn a little bit more about it, I would highly recommend this REASON trial that uh, Gaspari, along with a bunch of other people, published. This is a multi-centered study, 798 patients, and they found that 4.3 of them had a pericardial effusion and 38% of those had pericardiocentesis as part of their treatment. Now, what I like about this specific study is not only did I identify them and document which ones had a pericardial effusion, but they also were able to show, which is crazy, that patients who got a pericardiocentesis were actually much more likely to survive than those who didn't. So if you can identify it, you're actually increasing your patient survival rate. Can you imagine having a, an arresting group, like a cohort, and figuring out that if you just do a simple Honestly, it's a little scary, but it's not that hard. At bedside procedure, you increase their survival from 1.3%, which is all the other people, all the way up to 15.4%. So pretty dramatic increase in survivability when you identify a pathology like a tamponade and you do something about it. Now let's talk a little bit about tamponade itself in an arrest. Now, if I have a patient that has a pericardial effusion and they're arresting, meaning I'm doing CPR, I'm just assuming that it's tamponade, right? Because it's really hard to do all these kind of subtle calculations if you're actively doing chest compressions. So presence of an effusion with arrest, I'm doing a pericardial synthesis. However, if you have a peri-arrest patient with an effusion, that is a patient that you don't necessarily, you shouldn't necessarily go ahead and just do that pericardial synthesis without a little extra information because the patient could have this chronic pericardial effusion, let's say a uremic pericardial effusion or um, a cancer-related pericardial effusion, and they actually have a PE as the cause of their hemodynamic instability, not necessarily that effusion. So in that patient, you want to do a couple of extra things. Now we're looking at this right here. This is a parasternal long axis view of the heart. And there's a pretty big effusion around this heart right here, right? Pretty big one. Would you tap this patient? Would you automatically, this is a peri-arresting patient, would you tap this patient? And I'm looking at this, it's, it's a pretty big effusion, but there's a sign, if they're peri-arrest, there's a sign you wanna look for. Now, what about this guy right here? This is another, this is a sub xiphoid view, and we're seeing the right side of the heart more anterior here, left side of the heart over here, and we're seeing a significant pericardial effusion up here. Which one of these two would you tap and which one would you maybe not tap? Maybe watch. Now, the way that you diagnose tamponade in a non-arresting patient, so a peri-arrest or a sick-ish patient, is you identify the presence of that pericardial effusion and then you have to look for other things to help kind of clinch that diagnosis. And that can be, the earliest finding, right atrial diastolic collapse, which... To be honest, I use this occasionally, but the data that comes from it actually looks at right atrial diastolic collapse as a percentage of time over the entire cardiac cycle. They call it the RA inversion index. So it's a little complex, and so I don't use that as much, even though that technically is the first finding that you'll see. The next one is the RV diastolic collapse, which is uh, the one that we probably teach the most. You can look for pulses paradoxus, and then I almost invariably am gonna add that IVC to help me figure out if this is an obstructive shock or not, even though it's not like an echo thing, but I always add it. Let's talk about RV diastolic collapse. So this right here, this is one of the echoes that I showed you earlier, and we can see that the right ventricle, it looks like it's collapsing. At least at some point in the cardiac cycle, it is 
collapsing, right? But the collapse itself is not something that we need to focus on. I know that some people talk about a trampoline sign, like you look at this right ventricle, it looks like there's a trampoline, like someone's jumping on a trampoline or something like that. Like that, that's an okay sign. But if you have a patient that has an effusion and they're in shock, let's say from something else like blood loss, that ventricle is gonna look like it's you know pushing pretty hard, collapsing pretty hard, but it'll be in systole. So what I did here is I slowed it down. And what you do to figure out if a chamber is in systole or in diastole, you look at the valves. This is the tricuspid valve. This is the mitral valve. They, all, they open at about the same time. So if this valve is open, that is ventricular diastole. It's when it's trying to fill. So I can see here that when the valve is open, this free wall of the right ventricle actually pops open. And when the valves are closed, this is actually when the collapse happens. That means that in this specific case, we are seeing right ventricular systolic collapse, which is not tamponade. Let's take this one right here. This is that kind of fast. This guy's a little more tachycardic. This is a parasternal long axis view, and I like this view for it. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the mitral valve in relation to that right ventricular outflow track free wall. And we can see that when we slow it down, we can see that when the valve is open, that's when the free wall collapses. That means that this is collapsed during ventricular diastole, which means tamponade. So that's how you diagnose it. Now, there's a bunch of different ways to kind of help you. I like slowing it down, uh, but this is on Photoshop. Like this. I, I'm unaware of machines that have standardized, like slow it down to half speed. But what you can do is that your ultrasound machine, the whole time you're scanning, it automatically is saving six seconds retrospectively. So if you hit the freeze button on your machine and just cycle back with the mouse, you'll actually be able to see when the valve is open with relation to when the free wall is collapsed. Another thing that you can do, and this is, uh, you can do it on the sub xiphoid view, but I think the best view for it is the parasternal long axis view, is you can actually throw an M mode cursor on it. So you put an M mode cursor, just the same as you do for the EPSS, when you're looking for heart failure. And you can see here that this right here, this is the RVOT or the right ventricular outflow tract free wall. And we know that because right here we have about five centimeters, we have about five centimeters up here. And so it's just above the five centimeters. So this right here, this is the RV free wall. This right here is the mitral valve right here. Remember mitral valve opens twice in the cardiac cycle. I didn't know that until I started doing echoes, kind of cool. But you can correlate when exactly diastole is based off of where this is. And if you see it highlighted here in blue, this is diastole because the valves are open and it is when this free wall is collapsing. It's dipping down. This is another way that you can diagnose your RV diastolic collapse. Now, just some semantics uh, that I wanna make sure to mention. I like thinking about things as far as chamber size. So I say right atrial diastolic collapse. I'm talking about the atrium. Like I'm not talking about ventricular diastolic, like a collapse of the atrium during ventricular diastole. I'm talking about right atrial diastolic collapse of that chamber. So basically any time that you have collapse of a free wall, when that chamber is trying to fill, get big, that is when you have sonographic tamponade. Let's look at this image right here. This is an apical four chamber view. Let's focus in on the uh, right side of the heart, which is over here on the left. And we can see that when this valve is closed, that is atrial diastole. That's when we're seeing this dip of this wall. This is right atrial diastolic collapse. And also we have right ventricular diastolic collapse. When this valve is open, that's when we see a little flutter of that RV free wall. So we have RV diastolic collapse as well as RA diastolic collapse, both signs of tamponade, no bueno. So this is the uh, variation, uh, the pulsus paradoxus basically is what we're talking about next, which is the last little thing that people talk about. Now, remember when you think pulsus paradoxus, what you're looking at is you're looking at a um, change in the amount of blood that comes out of either the left side of the heart or the right side of the heart. You can actually check it on your physical exam if you know you do that. Um, you can actually check it. You listen for the pulse and see, or feel for the pulse at the wrist and see if the intensity goes down and up. It like uh, oscillates with respiration. There's a lot of things that can cause it. It's not just a tamponade thing, but it's something that can happen in tamponade. And the way you do this is you can do it with the ultrasound. You put your uh, pulse wave Doppler gate, the, the PW gate, 
through either the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve. And if you see a variation, this right here, if you look at these kind of wavy kind of lines, these peaks and uh, peaks and I guess troughs of the maximum velocity, um, you can see that there is a variation. If we look here on the right, let me see if I can make my mouse bigger here. Right here, we can see it here is probably the peak and here is probably the trough here. And this difference between the peak velocity and the bottom kind of velocity, if it's greater than 25%, that's considered pulsus paradoxus or variation in the inflow velocity. And you can also do it through the tricuspid, which that number is 40% uh, difference is considered abnormal. This one is just a little bit kind of like an academic kind of thing. I rarely do this because the heart, when it's in tamponade, is actually gonna move within the pericardial sac, right? And just that movement will move, basically it moves the maxima area of flow away from your pulse wave Doppler gate, right? Because you have to actually measure it in the exact same location to actually check this. And just that movement of the heart, even if it's like one centimeter off, it's changing where the pulse wave Doppler gate is actually measuring relative to the flow through the mitral valve. And so you might just get a variation that has nothing to do with the actual velocity variation. So I'll be honest, this is academic. I'm mentioning it here for the sake of like completeness. But this is not something that I'm typically doing is checking this, especially in a super sick, like respiratory distress, tachycardic patient. What I am doing almost invariably is this. This is the evaluation of the IVC. It's super easy. And this is not a discussion about like, you know, is this good for volume status? Is this good for volume responsiveness? I, I'm not gonna have that discussion because it's a, a complex topic and I don't even know what the right answer is to be perfectly honest. But what I use this for is basically it's it's been shown that it's a good surrogate marker for the CVP, the central venous pressure. And if you have a patient, let's say they have an effusion and they have the uh, IVC ultrasound that's on the left, that very thin IVC that has a low CVP. So if I have an effusion with a very low CVP, it's exceedingly unlikely that this patient has tamponade because to have obstructive shock, you need to have backup back into the veins, right? It's exceedingly unlikely. I'm not gonna say it never happens, but it's exceedingly unlikely. Alternatively, if I have that same echo and I see the clip here that's on the right, it's a very plump IVC that's moving a bunch of, uh, that is not changing its diameter, excuse me, with respiration, this patient very likely has tamponade because not only do they have this effusion, they have maybe some uh, right ventricular collapse, but they also have a very high CVP. So this is something that I use almost all the time, and especially if I'm on the fence if this is something that I need to act on or not. Now, the cool thing about ultrasound is not only can you diagnose this thing with ultrasound, you can also do something about it with ultrasound and be way more accurate. Now, these are the three different locations that you can do pericardiocentesis. Most of the time, at least when I was in residency, I was taught to go sub xiphoid and blind, which if you don't have an ultrasound machine, that's like an okay thing to do. But if you have an ultrasound machine, it's not always the best case. You always want to go where you have the biggest pocket. Also, if you go sub xiphoid, you're poking through a lot of different structures. You are poking through the, uh, hopefully not, but you might be poking through a little bit of stomach, bowel, who knows? You're definitely poking liver and you're definitely poking diaphragm and you're maybe getting the heart, right? So there's a lot of structures that you could accidentally be going through that are, are not great to go through. Although if it's blind, that's probably the safest one because you don't want to cause pneumothorax. When I do pericardiocentesis, almost invariably, I'm going apical or I'm going parasternal long. It's a little scary because we think about the lungs being there, but, but here's the thing. If you can see the effusion with the ultrasound, it means that there is no heart in the way, right? Because if, excuse me, lung, there's no lung in the way. If you can see the effusion, there's no lung in the way because if there was lung in between your probe and that effusion, you wouldn't be able to see the effusion because the air would be blocking your sound waves from getting to that effusion. So once I kind of got past that mentally, I was like totally cool with doing this in the kind of alternative routes. Here's a couple of examples. Here's an apical four chamber view. You guys, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a needle coming in top left of the screen going right here. Uh, let me bring my mouse pointer up. There you go. Right about here, we're seeing this uh, needle going into that pericardial sac with the apical four chamber view. This is one that I did quite a ways back when I started doing them. And it, you want to actually like identify the whole heart when you're doing this, at least I did initially. But, but the thing is, is that you actually, once you've identified that effusion, you don't need to have all that depth. It's completely useless. 
you can actually decrease your depth on that curvilinear transducer and much more easily see, number one, that effusion, which that's that black stripe right here in the middle, right there. This is the heart below it. And then this is uh, just the meat of the chest. And you can see that the needle, it's a lot easier to watch it coming in. I'm gonna bring this needle in just to the top left of the screen. You might be able to see a little bit of jiggling here, but you have the needle and you can bring it here very easy to get in there. And now this was one that I, I didn't do, but I was like ready to go. I had the, the central line kit because that's sometimes how I do these. If I can't get a pericarcinthesis kit, I just put a central line in there. Um, I had this ready to go with a linear transducer. Look at this resolution. How easy would it be with this linear transducer in the parasternal window? How easy would it be to just get that needle, right, the introducer needle, right on the inside of that effusion and then slide your uh, guide wire in, slide your catheter. It'd be so easy to do it, way easier than with the phase ray. And honestly, even with that curvilinear transducer. Uh, here is a case that one of my fellows had. So you can see over here on the uh, left side, you can see uh, an apical four chamber view. There's a big effusion. And over on the right, you can see that there was a linear transducer used. Um, you can see it right here. This is the guide wire actually in place going into that effusion. And then here, is the echo afterwards. So we can see a good resolution of it. Here's another case that another fellow of mine did. You can see an apical four chamber view. I'm gonna label it right here. Watch the needle go right into that effusion. Pretty sweet stuff, great images. You can see the uh, guide wire J tip going in. You can see it kind of curling against it. And right here, you can actually flush the pericardium. You see those bubbles in the pericardium? You can actually do a flush after you have your uh, catheter in, after you've done your J-tip, you put your catheter in next, you can actually do a little flush, right? if maybe one or two cc's, and if you see the bubbles in the pericardium, you know that you're in the pericardium. If you see those bubbles in the right ventricle, you should probably back up a little bit because you're, you're in the right side of the heart, which we don't want, but if it happens, we wanna be able, of course, to identify it. And then here is just a, a silly mannequin kind of example, these like billion dollar mannequins. You can see that you can uh, catch that going right in and you can see it with the curvilinear transducer. Now, one quick thing before we leave tamponade, don't forget when a patient presents and they're arresting or peri-arresting and you identify a previously undiagnosed pericardial effusion, make sure that you look for that dissection flap because that, that is a, a fairly common cause of pericardial effusions, at least in arrest, is an ascending uh, arch dissection. And you can see this right here, this is the um, aorta. This is a parasternal long axis view. And you can see there's a little flap that comes in and out of view in that ascending aorta. This is a patient that was peri arrest due to this dissection. All right, the next T is going to be trauma. Now there is two types of trauma. There's internal blood loss, there's external blood loss. Hopefully you've done an examination and you can identify if there is external blood loss, right? I mean, that's that's a given. So what we're gonna talk about is internal blood loss. And we're gonna do a, a very quick review here on the FAST exam. Now, this is the order I usually go for. I usually start with the right upper quadrant because the FAST exam is binary. It's either positive or it's negative. Once one region is positive, especially in an arresting patient, I don't like check the other ones. It doesn't matter to me. Um, I'm just trying to say, is there blood in the belly or not? Make sure that you get this caudal tip of the liver. So this right here, this is the caudal tip of the liver. This is the inferior pole of the kidney right here. Make sure that you get this interface between the two. You can also look for Morrison's pouch, which you should, but it's gonna be positive first, a little more inferiorly to the Morrison's pouch. The next view that I get, because it's the next most common place to look, is going to be in the uh, the pelvic view. I always do this sagittal transverse. Yeah, I can give you a little more data, but I'll tell you, especially in males, because of the seminal vesicles, I always get confused with the transverse view. So I only ever do the sagittal view. I've never gotten a sagittal view of something, so probe marker up towards the head, and then had to convert, uh, confirm that it was something or had the absence of something on the transverse view. But every time I use a transverse view, I always end up flipping it to the sagittal to just make sure that what I'm looking at is actually in the peritoneum, which this area right here is the peritoneum. This is where we're looking for fluid. This right here, this is the seminal vesicle. It looks just like free fluid, but we can see that's attached to this structure right here, which is the prostate and a physiologic structure. So I always do sagittal. The least most common place for fluid to be present in isolation is gonna be the left upper quadrant. The left upper quadrant is not a mirror image of the right upper quadrant. The left upper quadrant, you don't look 
in Morrison's pouch or the um, area deep to Morrison's pouch, you look supra splint. That's actually where you're looking. It's a completely different area. And let's go through some normals and abnormals. This is a right upper quadrant. On the left, we have normal. And on the right, we have abnormal. There's a little slice right here of an effusion just around that caudal tip of the liver. You got to be very slow, diligent with your sweeps to make sure you don't miss stuff. Here is an abnormal pelvic fat. These are both sagittal views. We can see on the right side, we have this kind of triangle of fluid over here. Let's jiggle it so you can see a little bit easier. Right there above this guy right here, which is the bladder. This is a positive pelvic flask. And then this guy over here, left side, we have no abdominal fluid in the left upper quadrant. And then on the right side, we're seeing hypoechoic fluid right here above that spleen, abnormal. Now, before I leave the FAST exam, one thing to remember, I guess three things to remember, is that the trauma, uh, trauma, so intra-abdominal hemorrhage definitely can cause a positive FAST, and that's usually what we're looking at. However, remember, that's not the only thing that will give you an abnormal FAST exam. I know there's trauma, but you know, in the word, focused assessment of sonography in trauma, but non-trauma things can definitely give you a positive FAST. If you have a ruptured, any of these th things, AAA, ectopic, or ruptured bowel, all of these will give you a positive FAST and are things that actually give you data points to help you know what to do with that patient. Here is maybe the most intense AAA I've ever seen right here. Um, this had previously been stented. That's what those two kind of hyperechoic rings are in the center. It's a previous stent. And you can see that there's actually an endo leak. And this is probably like a 12 centimeter AAA. If you see this, like you're, you should pucker. Like this is, this is very intense. This is an aorta. And you see that there's like a little outpouching on the more superficial part of that aorta. Kind of looks like an eyeball, right? It looks like a little bit like an eyeball to me. What this is, is this is actually a rupture, an anterior rupture of a AAA that is actually contained. This is a very scary thing. Most patients with ruptured AAA, if they don't rupture retroperitone retroperitoneally, they're gonna die before they get to you. So if you find this, like you have to be very careful and get this guy to a vascular surgeon as soon as possible because these anterior uh, ruptures are very bad for patients. This right here is a 19-year-old female that came in with an acute onset of abdominal pain. And you can see that this is a very positive fast. We have all this hypoechoic fluid over here on this area. There's a liver here, kidneys down here. And whenever I have a non-trauma female with a positive fast, the first thing I'm thinking is, could this be a ruptured ectopic? And I looked there first, and then I went down to the pelvis. And this is something that can be a little bit confusing. Fresh blood is gonna be hypoechoic or dark, but when you have coagulated blood, it actually might be a little bit more echogenic, right? Because clot is gonna be a little lighter than the dark fresh blood. This right here is the uterus right here. And then over here, we have just a lot of clot, just clot all over the area just deep to that, uh, that uterus. This is clot, this was an ectopic pregnancy. Here is the last non-trauma fast, positive fast. This is a nursing home patient that came in with altered mental status, seemed to have a little bit of abdominal pain on examination. And you can see there's a little sliver of, of something, of some kind of fluid over here. And she didn't have any history of liver disease or anything like that. And this is her x-ray. Can you guys identify the pathology here? It's pretty like bread and butter emergency medicine right here. We have a bunch of air underneath this diaphragm right here. And air underneath the diaphragm, abdominal pain, no like surgeries yesterday where there might be some leftover like CO2 from them inflating the abdomen. This is a ruptured bowel. So this could be like a ruptured ulcer, um, ruptured small bowel, anything. So this is ruptured bowel. This patient needs surgery quickly. All right, let's move on to my... Uh, probably my favorite thing, which is lung ultrasound, and that's going to be the identification in an arrest or peri-arresting patient of tension pneumothorax. Now, we learn this, right? I mean, at least I learned this in residency and medical school, that you have a tension pneumothorax by patient having shock, them having jugular venous distension, decreased bowel sounds, and tracheal deviation. This is, I'm sure it's got like some cool triad name, right? Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but this data doesn't come from humans. This actually comes from dogs. This comes from dog studies who have completely like, you know, a dog's like chest, right? It's like this a completely different shape from a human's chest. They have different physiology compared to humans. So this is where they got it from. 
uh, you know, long time ago, like turn of the century situation. There's other studies that have actually looked to see how common these actually are in uh, tension and tension pneumothorax. This was from a systematic review and it looked at uh, 86 patients that weren't uh, intubated and 97 patients who were intubated, so vented and not vented. This is how often they're present in tension pneumothorax, right? So these signs are very not sensitive. So you can't use their absence to rule it out. I will say, if you have a patient that looks super sick and they have all those signs, it's probably a tension pneumothorax, right? I mean, there, there's always certain things to use with certain types of presentations, but I would not use the absence of these things ever to rule it out. What's crazy to me is this decreased bowel sounds. These patients had tension pneumothorax and at best, 58% of them had decreased breast sounds on the side of that pneumothorax. Isn't that crazy? 58% had diminished breast sounds. Not 100% like we're taught. 58% had diminished breast sounds. So that's why the physical exam is, is maybe not the best as far as ruling it out, but the ultrasound does really good. The ultrasound is probably the best non-CT test for diagnosing pneumothorax, irrespective of your patients, like if they're sick or not. It's uh, as specific as chest x-ray and significantly more sensitive than chest x-ray. So to diagnose this, a little bit of a, of a review, we are gonna look for that lung sliding right there using our linear transducer, although the curvilinear will work just as well. I have a patient here, left side is left chest, right side is right chest, and we can see that on the right side, that white line is not sliding back and forth. I see no ants marching. I see no lung gliding. On the left side, I'm seeing great motion of that white line that's right in the middle of the screen. I'm seeing sliding back and forth. So this patient, if they're peri-arrest, I don't see lung sliding on one side. I'm gonna highly suspect that this patient has a pneumothorax as their diagnosis. Remember, there are other things besides a pneumothorax that can cause the absence of lung sliding, which is not fair, right? I mean, patients, if let's say you are a little aggressive with their intubation, you go right main stem, they don't have a great heartbeat and they're paralyzed, you might not see, if you are right main stemmed, you might not see great lung sliding on that left side or lung sliding at all on that side. And, and yet, you know, that's due to that intubation. You don't want to stick a chest tube on that side without lung sliding when it was just a main stem intubation. Patients that are severe COPD ears where they're so obstructed, they're not moving any air, they're not going to have lung sliding either. So I use the presence of lung sliding to rule it out but to rule it in, most of the time, I'm gonna be using this guy right here. This is a lung point. You can see towards the right side of the screen, we have the presence of lung sliding on the right and the absence of lung sliding on the left. And you can see that this is you putting the transducer right on the edge of that pneumothorax, basically when that pneumothorax starts. The lung point, which that's what this is, rules it in. So this is specific, lung sliding is more sensitive. Now, it's a little bit tricky, you guys, because if you have actual tension pneumothorax, that lung is gonna be just like a little nub right at the hilum. You need to have a piece of the lung up in order to see a lung point. So if someone's got a tension pneumothorax, you probably won't see a good lung point. So that's where your kind of pretest probability, your other findings kind of come into play as far as what you're gonna do about it. There is a, there's not a whole lot of like prospective study because this isn't a super common diagnosis, but it has been reported, and I agree with these, that you should suspect tension pneumothorax if you have the absence of lung sliding, shifting of the heart to the opposite side, and then a plump IVC because a tension pneumothorax is a form of obstructive shock. So that's why you have obstructive shock, it's gonna back up into the IVC and cause that plump IVC. Now let's say you are doing chest compressions and you really wanna know, do I also need to stick a chest tube in this patient? If you look at the lungs with during chest compressions, this is what you're gonna see. And this is, I can't really, yeah, you know, like I've looked at a lot of ultrasounds and I've looked at a lot of lung ultrasounds because I like them. I can't tell if this is sliding or not. It's very difficult for me to definitively tell if there was sliding or not. And also like the patient's being bagged and I swear, when they're being bagged, it's it's very rare to actually see good lung sliding with bagging, not like with a patient taking a big spontaneous breath. But there's something that can really help you out here, and that is this. It is the presence of a vertical artifact that starts at the top of the pleural line and extends all the way down to the bottom of the visible screen. That's this guy right here, this kind of white thing. Come on, mouse, there we go. Right here, you can see there's that white line. If you see B lines, even if the patient's lung isn't moving, B lines actually rule out 
a pneumothorax. The reason for that is that the B lines are produced from the visceral pleura, which is the lung. The parietal pleura is like the meat. And what you're seeing is you're seeing the visceral pleura, if you see lung sliding, the visceral pleura move relative to the parietal pleura. So if you see B lines, it means you're visualizing the visceral pleura. So there's no air between the parietal and visceral pleura. So no pneumothorax. The presence of B lines, even in the absence of lung sliding, rules out a pneumothorax. That's what I do in an arresting situation. Let's move on to thrombosis. We have the cardiac thrombosis, which is an MI, and then we have a pulmonary embolism. PE is some of my favorite things to diagnose. Again, I don't want anybody to have it, but if they have it, I wanna be the person who finds it. You can look for two things, right heart strain and a DVT. The best view for right heart strain is to get an apical four chamber view. The left sided, uh, I guess, chambers over here, this is actually the right heart, this is the left heart over here. You want the left heart, which is on the right side, to be bigger than the right heart, which is on the left side of the screen. This here is abnormal. We see a pretty big RV relative to the LV. And we're seeing this guy right here. There's a little dip in the, uh, where's my mouse? There we go. A little dip in the apex of that right ventricle. This is a McConnell sign. I have like a whole actually lecture on acute versus chronic right heart stuff. I love acute versus chronic right heart stuff. But just McConnell sign is something that you can use to, to kind of make you think about if this is like an acute process or not, especially if you have a patient population that might have chronic right heart enlargement. Now the caveat, one, one crazy thing about right heart enlargement is that we think about right heart strain as being PE in an arrest. Sometimes. I always thought that if you have a patient, you've been doing CPR, you see right heart strain, boom, it's a PE, push thrombolytics. Unfortunately, that's probably not actually the case. Now, if I have a peri-arrest, meaning they're currently um, hemodynamically maybe unstable, but they're perfusing, maybe they're awake. If I see right heart strain and they don't have a previous history in that situation, I'm very likely to push TPA. Very, very likely. I'm never going to say, like, I'm not a Sith, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not absolute one way or the other. But very likely what I'll do if I see right heart strain in a peri-arrest patient, I'm going to push it. But if your patient's been getting CPR, you didn't do an initial echo. Let's say they've been getting CPR 10 minutes down the road. You actually are able to do your ultrasound. You see right heart train at that point. That's where you run into issues where it might actually not be from a PE. This is a very interesting study. Uh, this study, they took 24 pigs and gave them cardiac arrest by a different way. So it was like arrhythmia, hypoxia, and a PE. And they wanted to see how often that right heart got bigger. And this scale here, you notice every single one of these lines they're going up. I'll just tell you like one of them is, is from a PE, one of them is from arrhythmia, one of them is from hypoxia. The right heart size, that's what's on the Y axis, increases regardless of the etiology of that arrest. Anytime that somebody doesn't have flow through their heart well, which even if you're doing great chest compressions, they're not going to have great flow through their heart, some of that blood's going to back up into the right side of the heart. And that's actually what this study was alluding to. This was a uh, YouTube video that I found. You can see here, this is the right heart uh, on the left side right there. This is the left heart. I want you to focus in on the right heart. This is 15 minutes of, it looks like a ventricular tachyarrhythmia. Look what happens to that right side of the heart. You see how big it's getting? It's much bigger than the right side of the heart. And this is why you can't use the uh, enlarged RV during CPR as a definite diagnosis of a PE because of this. Now, of course, clinical picture, pretest probability, all that stuff is in play, but definitely pause. If you're thinking about pushing thrombolytics, definitely pause and think, could this just be from my chest compressions or the fact that they were not having forward flow? Let's talk about the other one, DVT. Now, what I like about DVT is this is away from chest compression. So you can be like away from the area where all the action is happening and actually look for these things. If you have a patient in whom you suspect might have a DVT, sorry, a pulmonary embolism, and you find a DVT, this study, this was actually a pretty big study in 2005, found that you have a positive likelihood ratio of 16.2 for a PE. So if you identify a DVT and you suspect a PE, that actually dramatically increases the probability that your patient actually has a PE. It's pretty sweet, right? Remember, anything greater than 10 is enough to rule it in. This right here is normal. We have a good compression of this common femoral vein. We have the walls touching. And then over here, we have abnormal. We can actually see a clot within that vein as well as see the absence of compression. 
Now, regional wall motion abnormalities are something that we definitely talk about. Um, there's few situations in which I do it when they're peri-arrest. Because if they're peri-arrest, I get an EKG. It's very hard to get an EKG when your patient is arresting, right? So what you can do is you can actually look for changes in how much the walls of the left side of the heart are contracting and expanding. So how much thickening you're seeing. This is great. This is a great normal heart. We have a perishable long axis view here. We're looking at this wall right here. Great contraction. It's all pretty equal. Now, contraction, I'm not talking about ejection fraction. I'm talking about the wall thickness itself. Let's compare this normal with this abnormal. And I want you to focus in on this posterior wall on the right side, right here. You see how the diameter of that wall isn't changing at all? There's no contraction here. This is what a regional wall motion abnormality looks like on ultrasound. On my website, the Core Ultrasound website, we can actually we actually have this on there where you can know what uh, what blood vessels, what coronary arteries supply, what part of the heart. And you can use that to identify what part of the heart is messed up. Let's look at this. This is an apical four chamber view of the heart. Focus in on the apex. You see how the apex? While there is some movement, I'm not seeing great expansion and contraction of that apex. Here is this patient's EKG. Some big LAD lesion in this patient. All right, so that was identifying re reversible causes. Let's talk about how ultrasound can be used procedurally during your arrest. We talked about the pericardiocentesis, uh, life-changing, life-saving procedure that you can do at the bedside. One thing that I like talking about is, is IV access. And, but before I talk about IV access, I have to mention that if you have a sick patient and you don't have IV access, Guys, just just do the IO. Just do the IO. It's a, a big vein in a big blood vessel. This is the fastest way to get access. After you place the IO, if you're in an academic institution like you guys are, go ahead, have a different resident who's not running the resuscitation, have them try to place a femoral central line or, or whatever. That's fine. But if you're starting out, make sure, and you don't have access, just just drill that leg. They, they're, they can't feel it. It's not going to hurt them. It's okay, just do the IO, it's the fastest thing. If you're gonna be doing ultrasound guided vascular access, don't forget to do this, sequential needle tip tracking. Always gotta keep track of that needle tip as it goes into the lumen here. Now here is me doing it on a blue phantom. Um, now the thing is, is that remember the ultrasound machine itself doesn't know the difference between the needle tip and the needle shaft. So you always have to kind of stay uh, in front of it. I'm never moving my needle and my transducer at exactly the same time. It's always one than the other. I like the short axis. That's usually what I'm doing. So here I'm doing my poke. And as soon as I see that hyperechoic dot, I'm then stopping my needle, moving my transducer, then moving my needle until I see it on the transducer and so on and so forth until I see it in the center. This is all a brief review. If you need more information, talk to your regional experts. You guys have a lot of good ultrasound people there in uh, Vermont and in that region. Um, but I also have a website, coreultrasound.com, where I actually talk about each of these things a lot more in depth. Your central line, this is great in arrest, especially in the peri arresting patient, very large bore IV. The central line kit can be a little bit confusing. These are the tools that you need out of your central line kit. And really, to boil it down to its most basic, and this is any really access to anywhere, this works, okay? You start off with your introducer needle, put your guide wire in once you've identified whatever space you're trying to get into. This actually is the same technique for a pericardiocentesis as it is for a peripheral IV. Slide your guide wire in, then dilate, excuse me, by peripheral IV I meant central line. Then you dilate and then you slide in your catheter. Now, when I'm doing a rest, I'm not usually going for the carotid, I'm not usually going for the subclavian, I'm usually focusing in on the femoral vein itself. And here is how I'm doing the femoral vein. The femoral vein, especially in the patient population that I had in Kentucky, I haven't actually started working clinically here in California yet. So I don't know what the patients are like here, but in Kentucky, there there's often a little bit of like fluffiness between the skin and the vein that you're trying to cannulate. So I'm identifying exactly where that vein, the path is to make sure I'm getting it right in the center. I'm gonna do my initial poke into that central line. You can see here, I'm using that same technique, that same sequential needle tip tracking technique to get right into the center of that very deep uh, femoral vein. And then after that, after I kind of pop in there, I usually confirm it in the long axis. So here, I think I'm in, I flatten my needle to try to get more along the path of it. And then I'm confirming that I'm actually there in the long axis. After that, I'm gonna slide my guide wire in and do everything the same as I do a regular central line. Art lines, 
This is great. I'm gonna talk about it when we talk about identifying arrhythmias with your ultrasound. But art lines are great because if somebody doesn't necessarily like do a great job at palpating, like feeling a pulse, which we don't do, humans do not do a good job at identifying the presence or absence of a pulse, the art line is a great alternative method of doing that. The patient has a diastolic greater than 40, the patient is perfusing their brain and their heart, which is enough. This is performing the technique. This is the kit that I happen to have. I really like this arrow kit. And it has a little guide wire kind of like right in that kit already. And the technique is exactly the same technique as any other procedure. You identify your lumen. I'm a little dark on my screen here, so I'm gonna increase the gain, which it's a whole lecture about like maximizing the uh, resolution of your ultrasound screen or optimizing it. But I increased my gain a little bit right there. You can see I'm tracking the path to make sure I'm right in the center of it. And then I basically do the same thing I do for any other ultrasound guided procedure. I do that sequential needle tip tracking. I make sure I get to the center, then check it in the long axis after I think I'm in the center, and then slide that guide wire. And so you can see here, I'm doing very small, very subtle movements. And this is the same very small, subtle movements that I do in a very calm situation like I'm just in a patient's room, they're awake, we're chatting about our dogs, you know? I'm doing the same technique then as I am in an arresting patient. Slow, diligent, slow is fast. That's what I think about with procedures. Slide that guide wire in and you are good to go. Let's talk about ultrasound during pulse checks. Guys, we do not do well at pulse checks. We think we do, but we don't. I know what you're thinking, like, I don't know, like, I, I kind of do well with a pulse check. I mean, look, look at this homunculus. Do you guys remember this from med school, this homunculus? Look at these fingers. We have good sensory innervation of our fingers. Turns out, even though we have good sensory innervation of our fingers, based off of this sweet homunculus, it turns out we actually don't. This is a probably one of my favorite studies. It's an older study, but, you know, it, it checks out, 1996 resuscitation. Now in this study, it's really cool. What they did is they took 207 EMTs and they took them up to the cath lab and they had patients that were either on bypass or off bypass. So, so brilliant gold standard. They're either Their heart was connected or their heart was not connected, right? And they found that 10% of the time, these EMTs thought there was a pulse when there wasn't. Not great. Look at this number. 45% of the time, they thought they they thought there wasn't a pulse when there in fact was a pulse. And the average time it took them to make those wrong decisions was 24 seconds, so way longer than our 10 second pulse check. And the amount of time that these EMTs, 207 EMTs, got the correct answer within 10 seconds was 17%. And basically any study that looks at the pulse check, these are the numbers that they get. Very poor at the pulse check. The ultrasound is significantly better than any pulse check that we can do. Now, the reason this is so important is because every pause in chest compressions, even if it's the 10 seconds, it takes us a while to get back to the perfusion that we had before. It's not like you do your pulse check, you start compressions and immediately it goes back up. That's not how it works. It takes a little while for it to go back up. And you want to make sure that that time is as low or as small as possible. So let's talk about a pulse check here. So this right here, let's say you have, you've done two minutes chest compressions, you're on your second round and there's a pulse check and you place the ultrasound transducer on the chest and you see this right here. It's not, nothing. There's, there's nothing happening here. Nothing going on. This makes me so uncomfortable. What if somebody says, I feel a pulse? They don't feel a pulse, at least not the patient's pulse. So what I would say is in this situation, I would very politely call shenanigans and restart chest compressions. And in fact, if I see this, I'm not waiting for 10 seconds. This patient does not have a pulse. I can figure this out within three to five seconds, restart compressions. Here's another one. Now, what if somebody, you do a pulse check and you see this? This very wiggly, crazy looking heart is in VTAC. This patient needs synchronized cardioversion. What about this one right here? Maybe a little subtle. I want you to focus in on the mitral valves, the parasternal long axis view. Focus in on these mitral valves right here. They are just fluttering, right? This is V-fib. Regardless of what the monitor shows, this patient gets a shock. Here's another one that's a little subtle. I can't really see the valves, but focus in on the little bubbles that you see in that, specifically the right side of the heart, which is the left side of the screen. See those bubbles jiggling back and forth? That is an indication of VFib. This is somebody that you are going to shock. Now, what if you're doing a pulse check, you see this echo, 
And whoever's checking for pulses says, I don't feel a pulse. Do you resume, resume chest compressions? I would argue that in this situation, you don't resume chest compressions. There's a very high likelihood that this patient with this intense of an ejection fraction does actually have some kind of a perfusing rhythm. This is one that I want to throw in here just to be careful. There is some movement of bubbles through here. But if you see this, you see a very low ejection fraction. You don't really see that mitral valve moving very much. Check and see if that movement happens in time with bagging. This is the effect of bagging on your patient. So be very cognizant of that. Now, what if you see this guy right here? This is a patient that it's, you see they're in between, they're in the middle of a, of a pulse check and you see this echo and the provider like can't really feel a pulse. I definitely see some ejection fraction. I see some movement of this heart for sure. But I don't know if this is perfusing. I mean, this is like a chronic heart failure patient. This might be their baseline, but I don't know what they were beforehand. So what I do in this situation is I make sure to put in that central line. That central line is super important. Excuse me, that arterial line. That arterial line is very important. And in fact, when I work with residents, you know, you have multiple people in the room, just from the start, just have somebody else start working on either a brachial line or pr preferably a femoral arterial line to check what those pressures are. And you can use that to actually help see during compressions, the adequacy of those compressions as well. Speaking of which, on ultrasound, you can also use it to check for how well compressions are going. What you do is you just find a window. Sometimes it's the apical four, sometimes it's the sub xiphoid. It's, it's like never the perishernal long, by the way. But you can see on the left side of the screen, I'm seeing great compressions of that left ventricle. It's that bottom chamber. This is a Lucas device that I happen to be able to get a good sub xiphoid view of it. Great compressions of that left ventricle. If we look over here, this left ventricle, not really moving all that much. This is not great compression. So you can also use it to tell that uh, thing. Good compressions are bad compressions. Now, before I leave this, I have to mention one thing. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to move forward just a tad bit to this. This is a very important concept, and that is your ultrasound and pulse check delays. Now, this is to me, this is one of these annoying clickbait things where people like say like, ultrasound delays, pulse checks, don't use ultrasound just because they saw an abstract that said that you really have to understand that the ultrasound itself is not delaying anything. The ultrasound is an inanimate object that does whatever you as the clinician tell it to do. So the ultrasound doesn't delay pulse checks, humans delay pulse checks. Remember, no matter where you are in the world, 10 seconds is always 10 seconds. These are the two studies that are often quoted amongst others that talk about this. And they say non-ultrasound pulse checks was X amount of time, and the ultrasound guided pulse checks were higher. Look at the timing of their non-ultrasound pulse checks. They're all bigger than 10 seconds. Unfortunately, this is a, and I mean this respectfully as like an educational point of view, these are poorly run codes. Even when they don't use ultrasound, their pulse checks are way too long. So what I do is I have the person who is actually keeping track of the time. When it's pulse check, they count down from 10 to zero. And when they um, get to two, I take my transducer off, I wipe the gel and get ready. If I can't get a good view within those eight seconds, assume that they don't have a good view and resume compressions. That's how you get around that whole issue with the pulse checks not working. Okay, so what had happened was I actually ran out of time. I started this lecture a little bit late. And so I skipped through a couple of my slides that I you know, did actually want to comment on for the purposes of this podcast. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go and talk about those specific things. We're gonna start off with this. How do you use ultrasound to prognosticate your patient? Now, one thing that I learned was basically if they have standstill, they're going to die. And if they don't have standstill, they have a chance, which that's true. But let, let's look at the data to try and figure out exactly what to do with that. So let's talk about the reason trial, amazing study, Gaspari et al., over 700 patients, multiple centers where they looked at, they did an ultrasound basically at the beginning, their primary outcome, so they did the ultrasound at the beginning at the end of ACLS, and their primary outcome was their ability to predict survival to hospital discharge based off what the ultrasound showed. And they found when they have motion, they had an odds ratio of 3.7 of hospital 
discharge. Now, this was just hospital discharge. They were unable to, to give us the information as far as if they were neurologically intact, but it was survival to hospital discharge, and they were able to show motion versus no motion. So this is survival to hospital discharge, no motion. Uh, sorry, if they had motion, it was 3.8% survival to hospital discharge, and if they had no motion, 0.6%, less than 1%. So it's very low likelihood, but here's the thing. It's it's not zero, you guys. It's not 0% survival. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. If you have somebody that has no motion on their initial echo, but they have a good otherwise prognosis, they've gotten great CPR, maybe they just arrested in your ambulance bay, this is a patient that I wouldn't stop chest compressions just because I had a echo that showed no motion. On the flip side, if I had a patient who you know, is 97 years old, cancer, heart failure, COPD, uh, dialysis, multiple amputations. If I have that patient and I they've gotten chest compressions for like 20 minutes and I see no motion on my initial echo, I'm probably a little more likely to think that that patient, uh, that the CPR for the resuscitation might actually be futile in that patient. Every patient is gonna be different and you have to make sure to remember that, that you always have to take your clinical gestalt. This ultrasound is just a data point, but understand that the absence of movement does not necessarily mean that the patient won't survive to hospital discharge. This is another big study, a Canadian group multi-center, 223 patients. They found basically the same numbers. When you have motion, they had a survival to hospital discharge of 9.5% versus 0.6%. So it's like identical to the uh, reason trial. This was a meta-analysis that looked at a bunch of stuff, a little bit older, but still great. 2012, it found that out of 2.4, so patients who had standstill, 2.4% of those actually had return of spontaneous circulation. So it's a different thing, right? This is, ROSC is not necessarily survival to hospital discharge, but it is a metric to show you that not all of these patients with standstill necessarily aren't going to survive. So always remember ultrasound is a tool in your quiver. It's not the only thing. You have to think about other stuff like the patient factors, history, the rest of your physical exam, and other tests to figure out exactly what to do with your patient. The other reason why I struggle with this, the whole like, you know, standstill versus not in arrest is this. The fact that we don't always actually agree on what standstill is. This is a quiz study of 127 patients that it was a quiz. So you showed a bunch of ultrasounds and the physicians were to say, standstill or not, and they found that there was only moderate correlation. So there was a little bit of disagreement. Moderate correlation is, is okay, it's good. It's not great though. It's not like above nine, above 0.9, which is what I would like. So we don't necessarily agree on what standstill is, and standstill doesn't always mean that they're going to not survive. So that's why another reason I don't always use standstill as a, a prognostic indicator for every single patient, because sometimes it doesn't really matter, right? These patients could potentially still survive. Remember, it's so important, 10 seconds is 10 seconds. And the way that I decrease the amount of time that I'm doing that uh, ultrasound guided pulse check is when they're doing the pulse check. So they're saying, you know, whatever, 15 seconds till pulse check. I'm doing two things. I'm charging that defibrillator and I'm grabbing my ultrasound, putting gel on my ultrasound, and whatever hand is closest to the patient, that's the one that I'm using. And then I am using a little rag in my non-close to the patient hand, whatever that is, depending on where I'm at. When the uh, pulse check happens, I grab an overhand grip on that transducer, and I basically put it right in that sub of you just like elbow up in the air just as hard as I can to try and get that um, in the right view as fast as possible. And as soon as I'm done, as soon as I count down, I have, well, I don't, the person keeping track of time is gonna count down. As soon as they get to two seconds, I'm gonna take the probe off, wipe it off. Now there are different ways you can, or different methods you can use to try and decrease the amount of time your pulse checks are. This is pretty sweet. This is the CASA protoc uh, protocol that was initially published by a good friend of mine, Arun Nagdev. And what we did is basically split it up. So you have your job during the pulse check is just do your best at finding the view. That's your job. And then during the pulse checks, you can, you know, you're recording these images when you're doing the actual pulse check ultrasound, resume compressions. And while people are doing compressions, you can focus in on interpreting that image. So what they suggest is each subsequent pulse check, you are doing an echo, taking it off. You look for tamponade during that first kind of view. Then the second one, you look specifically, is there right heart strain? And the third one, you look specifically about cardiac 
activity. And I like this and it makes perfect sense to me. It's a really cool graphic that uh, my friend Mike Pratt at OSU uh, came up with to kind of help you out. And you can see that it did decrease the amount of pulse checks, but this is the same issue that I always have with these pulse check things, which is 10 seconds is 10 seconds. No pulse check should be longer than 10 seconds. So count down. When you get to eight, take your probe off. So those are my thoughts on cardiac arrest ultrasound. Remember, there is variations in practice. The ultrasound is not the only tool at your disposal. You have to use all of your skills and education as a provider to know exactly what to do. Just the ultrasound is very beneficial, especially if you've practiced using it. Don't forget to check out the core ultrasound question bank and fundamentals. And don't forget to check out our in-person course, Sound and Surf. That's soundandsurf.com, collaboration with Mike Macias of the Pocus Alice and me in person November 11th through the 13th of this year. So like a few months away. Hope to hear from you soon and happy scanning.